Hello and welcome to this week's first edition of uh, the Watchdog. We are just moments away from President Cyril Ramaphosa's address to the nation on the country's response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Last week, South Africans were given 48 hours to comment on amendments to the state of disaster regulations uh, that uh, were promulgated by Kogta Minister Ngosazana Zamini Zoma. We'll take you live to the Union buildings from where President Cyril Ramaphosa will deliver that address as soon as he starts with that. Well, while we're waiting for the president to walk into that media room any minute now, uh, let's do this. The price of fuel goes up again on Wednesday. A litre of petrol will increase by between 28 and 36 cents a litre, depending, of course, on the grade. While a litre of diesel will increase by between 1 rand 52 and 1 rand 68 cents a litre. The 1 rand 50 reduction in the fuel levy means means there's been some relief for consumers. The price of fuel will go up on Wednesday this week, but will not be as steep as earlier expected. The high increase has been set off by the reduction in the fuel levy by 150 for two months. The Department of Mineral Resources and Energy says it's because of the increase in oil prices during the period under review. This caused by the sanctions imposed on Russia and the limited supply from oil producers despite increasing global demand. The main reasons for these increases are as follows. Firstly, the higher oil prices, which led to higher prices of petroleum product, mainly due to the Russia-Ukraine conflict, uh, fuel demand concerns in China due to the lockdown, as well as the fact that the Yemen rebels attacked storage facilities in Saudi Arabia. Secondly, the stronger rent against the dollar, which cushioned the prices by around 17 cents per liter, 17 to 19 cents a liter. There is hope that the oil price will go down in the next two months, in time before the levy reduction comes to an end. A lot of depends on what is going to happen over the next two months. And we're talking here about international oil prices and the exchange rate of the rent. We've seen the exchange rate working in our favor, helping to contain uh, the impact of uh, high international oil prices. But what we hope for is that over the next few weeks, oil prices will come down actually come down enough to really result in a reduction in the basic fuel price. The price of paraffin will go up by 266 cents per litre and that of LP gas goes up by 250 per litre. Laura Safakomosi, SABC News, Johannesburg. Well, we're joined on the line by Robert Maguet, who is a DDG at the Department of Energy and Mineral Resources. Mr. Maguet, good evening. Thanks very much for your time. Good evening, Vio. I'm Director for Fuel Pricing in the Department, not DDG. Oh, oh sorry. Apologies. Apologies, Mr. Maguet. No um, I think what uh, concerns South Africans is uh, where to from now. In other words, uh, what's going to happen going into the future uh, beyond Wednesday, that is. Yeah, as you've seen, Vio, the ministers, uh, Minister of Energy, Minister of Finance, issued a joint statement uh, last week. Uh, we came up with this intervention for two months, mm -hmm. and when the intervention ends, we are going to implement other measures to also cushion the prices, such as implementing the review of the BFP, uh, such as introducing a, a price cap on 93 octane, and also uh, stopping publishing the, the diesel prices so that the diesel can be completely deregulated. Well, I mean, to an extent, um, with with regard to diesel, that uh, has been uh, happening, isn't it? Because, I mean, you go around, you see uh, filling stations that advertise, uh, uh, you know, lower diesel prices. How have, uh, have they been able, uh, been able to, 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 to do this? Yeah, as, uh, as I've just said now, the diesel price is not regulated. Mm. We only publish the maximum uh, wholesale list price. So at the service station level, they can sell at any given price. 
So what we want to do now going forward is to completely stop publishing the wholesale list price so that it can be wholly uh, deregulated. Mm -hmm. And uh, the price cap, uh, do you think that's going to uh, do the trick in the long term? Well, with the price cap on 93 octane, the, the intention is that once you have a price cap, those retailers or oil companies that can afford to sell that fuel at a lower price will then be able to do so. Because under the current situation, they cannot do it because it's a regulated price. So you cannot sell at any other price except the regulated price. So in order to give them a chance to see if they can lower the price, we then introduce a cap, which is the maximum price, then you can sell it at any price lower than that. Mm -hmm. And um, just any other ideas, perhaps uh, they may not have uh, crystallized, uh, I mean, for, for, for now, but are there other things that you, you, you have started thinking about um, um, as well? Uh, we, we always exchange notes and uh, check what other countries are doing and see what is, can be applied to South African conditions and so on. So some of the countries have introduced what is known as a, a, a price stabilization fund. So how it works is that if the prices, for example, drop by one rate, part of that money will be put in the account. Uh, and when the price go up by a certain amount, that money can then be used to cushion the prices. That is mainly to do with the fluctuations in, uh, of the rent and the prices itself, exchange rate and the prices itself. So that's something that we, we are at a technical level, we are looking at, it's not the, uh, even uh, uh, what we call published or announced by the department, which is work that we are doing on the background. Mm -hmm. So we always look at what other countries are doing, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 is, is that about the, 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 the only thing that other jurisdictions um, are, are doing to, to, to help cushion um, their people? Yeah, if you look at the current intervention by government in particular on the fuel lane, mm. we actually looked at the number of countries and we realized that they are mainly looking at the at their fuel tax uh, to, to cushion the prices. Because we, are, if you look at the, the actual import price, there's not much leeway there because the, the prices are determined by the international market. Mm -hmm. So the only leeway for most countries was to tap into the, uh, the fuel tax or the fuel lane, if you like. Mm -hmm. um, uh, w w would I be taking things a bit too far um, if, for example, I ask about, you know, the oil exploration um, initiatives and how they could help us um, in the situation? Yeah, that's, that's quite correct, uh, Vuyo. If you can uh, ever own oil in the country, then the, the dollar exchange rate won't be a factor for us. The same will apply for the, the Karoo shale gas. Uh, if all the regulations could be finalized and we start exploring that shale gas, uh, it becomes a local resource. Therefore, the exchange rate uh, won't be a factor. Then we can also move away from the import parity pricing because then we'll be having the, the feedstock uh, locally. Uh, is it just the regulations that are holding things back um, at, uh, at this stage or is opposition um, um, to these projects uh, a, a big factor as well? Well, with the shale gas, I know that there's a lot of work that is being done by Council for Geoscience uh, doing uh, geological uh, research and looking at how much of the, the, uh, the, the shale gas is found there underground. There, I would say it's really about the, the background work that must be done and so on. Of course, on the exploration side, yeah, it, there's a lot of, lot of opposition around exploration and so on. I think that's really what is delaying some of the investment in that regard. You know what is happening in the Eastern Cape. Mm. Um, are there any conversations perhaps taking place behind closed doors uh, to try and uh, make sure that everyone sort of tries to find, people try to uh, find one another? Uh, definitely, we are, there, there are a lot of conversations that are taking place, though I'm not party and I'm, I don't have much of the information in that regard, but I know that the other colleagues in the department are seized with that responsibility. Mm -hmm. Well, let's hope that 
um, indeed those conversations are ongoing so that we make very wise choices that are in the interests uh, of uh, all of us. Thank you very much for your time, Mr. Maike, Robert Maike, who is Thank with you. the Department of uh, Mineral Resources and uh, Energy today. Minister Mandashe uh, announced adjustments to fuel prices effective from the 6th of April, which is on Wednesday. Well, President Cyril Ramaphosa will be addressing the nation any time or any minute from now on developments in the country's fight against COVID-19. Speaking last month, Ramaphosa announced government's intention to lift uh, the state of the nation that came into effect a little over two years ago. The state of disaster was declared after the country recorded its first COVID-19 case in March 2020. South Africans have been invited to comment on proposed COVID-19 draft regulations before the 16th of this month. And tonight's address will, of course, be speaking to what people have suggested uh, and presumably um, will then speak to what uh, the government has taken uh, into account and what the decision, the, the decision ultimately um, has been right on your screen are the COVID-19 statistics um, for the country as of this afternoon. Um, we're talking about 685 new cases, um, 11,506 active cases, and uh, I'm, I'm told the president is now uh, about to speak. Let's take you live to the union buildings. No, no, no. Is it on the screen? Okay. Uh, they're not ready yet, but we will take you there as soon as the president is ready to speak. Let's take you back to um, those, those numbers. I said initially earlier, 685 uh, new cases, 11,506 active uh, um, cases. Um, and that's, of course, in the last reporting um, um, cycle. If you do a breakdown by province, uh, Gauteng um, is, is leading with 315 um, um, cases. Limpopo has only three. Uh, Mpumalanga has 36. KwaZulu-Natal, 122. Uh, the Western Cape, 137. So Gauteng... Um, followed by the Western Cape, followed by KwaZulu-Natal. Those are the, the provinces um, that are leading as things stand. And I remember from an interview we did last week with the Deputy Director General of Health warning that uh, we are not out of the woods just yet. Um, so we should all continue to take care um, uh, of things we shouldn't uh, behave uh, recklessly but we'll hear uh, what the state of affairs is and what the government's thinking is um, around the state of disaster when the president speaks any minute from now Okay, we are still uh, waiting for the president. He was scheduled to speak at 8 o'clock, according to uh, an alert that was sent earlier um, by the president's office. So we are expecting him to walk into the media room at the union buildings any minute from now and start speaking to the nation. There he is. He's ready. Let's take you there live. San Bonani, Riperile, Dumelang, Dimadequan. Good evening, Huyenach. Fellow South Africans, for the past 750 days, our country, South Africa, has been in a national state of disaster. This is an extraordinary situation that is unprecedented 
in our country's history. The declaration of a state of disaster was a response to a global health crisis that posed a grave threat to the lives and the well-being of our people. There is no doubt that such a response was necessary under these circumstances. The declaration of the national state of disaster on the 15th of March in 2020 enabled and empowered government to take the measures that prevented many more people from becoming severely ill and saved countless lives. These measures were effective in slowing down the rate of infection, easing pressure on our hospitals, and providing the time we needed to develop the infrastructure, resources, and capacity to manage a large number of people who became ill as a result of COVID-19. The National State of Disaster also provided us with the legal basis for the introduction of the special 350 rand social relief of distress grant, which continues to bring much needed relief to those most affected by COVID-19 pandemic. It enabled the establishment of the COVID TERS scheme, which provided wage support to millions of workers in our country. The national state of disaster also enabled the provision of relief to small businesses, the extension of the validity of vehicle and driver's licenses and the management of the pandemic in educational institutions, among other things. All these measures were necessary not only to respond to the devastating effects of the pandemic on human health, but also to limit the great cost to society and to our economy. This is precisely the purpose for which a state of disaster is intended, to enable an effective disaster response and management that saves lives. However, in the context of a free and open democratic society, the additional powers that a state of disaster provides are temporary and limited. They should be maintained only as long as they are absolutely necessary. As I said in the State of the Nation address, we have now entered a new phase in the COVID-19 pandemic. The changing nature of the pandemic in our country was most evident in the fourth wave of the pandemic in December and January. Although we recorded a far higher number of infections in the fourth wave than in each of the previous waves, there were relatively fewer cases of severe illness, hospitalization, and death. During the third wave in July last year, the highest average daily number of COVID-related deaths recorded was 420. In the fourth wave, in February this year, the highest daily number of COVID-related deaths was 240. In the past week, this number has dropped to just 12. We are seeing a similar pattern in our health facilities. Of the 108,000 regular beds in our hospitals in the country, only 1,805 are currently occupied by COVID-19 patients. Of the 5,600 ICU beds in our country, only 175 are occupied by COVID-19 patients. This is part of a downward trend that is enabling us to return to normality in public health facilities. This shows that while the virus continues to circulate, it is not causing the same levels of severe illness that requires hospitalization or the same number of deaths. While the pandemic is not over and while the virus remains amongst us, 
these conditions no longer require that we remain in a national state of disaster. Going forward, the pandemic will be managed in terms of the National Health Act. The draft health regulations have been published for public comment. Once the period for public comment closes on the 16th of April 2022 and the comments have been considered, the new regulations will be finalized and promulgated. Since the requirement for a national state of disaster to be declared in terms of the Disaster Management Act are no longer met, Cabinet has decided to terminate the national state of disaster with effect from midnight tonight. The Disaster Management Act provides that certain elements of the regulations may remain in place for a limited period for post-disaster recovery and rehabilitation. Accordingly, certain transitional provisions will remain in place for a period of 30 days after the termination of the national state of disaster to ensure essential public health precautions and other necessary services are not interrupted while the new regulations in terms of the National Health Act come into effect. What this means is that all regulations and directions made in terms of the Disaster Management Act following the declaration of the national state of disaster in response to COVID-19 are repealed, meaning done away with, with effect from midnight tonight, with the exception of a few transitional measures. These transitional measures, which will automatically lapse after 30 days, are the following. Firstly, we will still be required to wear a face mask in an indoor public space. This is necessary to prevent transmission in high-risk places, especially while many people remain unvaccinated. A mask is not required when outdoors. Secondly, the existing restrictions on gatherings will continue as a transitional measure. This means that both indoor and outdoor venues can take up to 50% of their capacity without any maximum limit, provided that proof of vaccination or a COVID test not older than 72 hours is required for entrance to the venue. Where there is no provision for proof of vaccination or a COVID test, then the current upper limit of 1,000 people indoors and 2,000 people outdoors will remain. Thirdly, the existing provisions with respect to international travel remain in place. This means that travelers entering South Africa will need to show proof of vaccination or a negative PCR test not older than 72 hours. If a traveler does not submit a vaccine certificate or proof of a negative COVID-19 test, they will be required to do an antigen test on arrival. If they test positive for COVID-19, they will need to isolate for 10 days. Fourthly, the directions that provide for the payment of the special 350 rand social relief of disaster grant will remain in place. This will enable the Department of Social Development to finalize the regulations that will allow the payment of the grant to continue. Fifthly, directions that provide for the extension of the validity of a learner's license, driving license card, professional driving permit, and registration of a motor vehicle will remain in place. All other disaster regulations will fall away at midnight tonight. These include regulations <clears throat> on isolation of persons, on schools and access to old age homes, on public transport, on initiation practices, on cargo transportation, and on criminalization of non-adherence to these rules. The end of the national state of disaster also means that 
the coronavirus alert levels will no longer apply. So where we have been, alert level one no longer applies. The few transitional measures that remain are limited in scope and allow almost all social and economic activity to resume as normal. They are essential to reduce the risk of a further COVID-19 wave and further disaster. They also ensure that people can continue to receive their special 350 rand social relief of distress grant and that there is no interruption regarding driver's licenses. As I've explained, these are transitional measures that will lapse after 30 days. This will allow the management of the pandemic to be dealt with as appropriate by the health regulations or other provisions. There is one last measure that will outlive or remain and outlive the national state of disaster. This is the COVID-19 vaccine injury no-fault compensation scheme. This scheme was brought into force in April last year to provide quick and easy access to compensation to any person who, after being vaccinated, suffers serious injury because of receiving a COVID-19 vaccine. The COVID-19 vaccine injury no-fault compensation scheme, which is administered by the Department of Health, will continue after the national state of disaster ends. The scheme will only be terminated once it has achieved its purpose. So fellow South Africans, the end of the national state of disaster is an important milestone in our fight against the pandemic. It is a sign of the progress we have made together and a reminder of what our nation has endured. It is a moment to remember those who have lost their lives and the many people who are still struggling with the effects of the disease. It is also a time to pay tribute to the healthcare workers, the police, the soldiers, the volunteers, and other frontline workers for their dedication and their service during the worst times of the pandemic. The end of the national state of disaster is a firm statement of our determination to live our lives and rebuild our country even as this virus remains in our midst. It should give all of us the confidence to return to the lives we led before the pandemic with a few simple adjustments to protect those around us. It should provide our businesses with certainty that they can operate and invest without the prospect of further restrictions. Importantly, by ending the national state of disaster, we are each taking more individual responsibility for protecting our health and the health of others. Our greatest responsibility is to make sure that we are vaccinated against COVID-19 and to encourage others to get vaccinated. Vaccination is still our best defense against COVID-19. Vaccination is also the best weapon we have to reduce the chances of future waves of infection that overwhelm our health facilities and that may require that we once more declare a state of disaster. We must, however, remain cautious and ever vigilant. We have learned that this virus is unpredictable and that the situation can change rapidly. Therefore, we are continuing to work with the World Health Organization and other bodies to understand the increase of cases of infection in other parts of the world and to assess the relevant emerging scientific information. We keep reading and hearing 
that a number of other countries around the world are having great infections or higher infections. So we have acted together with purpose and resolve in the past two years to overcome this pandemic. So we need to remain vigilant. Although the pandemic is not over and although we continue to remain cautious, we can be confident that we are in a better position now than we have been at any other time over the last 750 days. We are hopeful that the worst is behind us and we are confident that there are only better days that lie ahead. This is now the time to grow our economy. Now is the time to get our country back on track. And this is the time for us to heal, to recover, and to rebuild. Africa. Mudzimu ashidupaze Africa chipembe. Osi katekisa Africa. Mudimu. I thank you all. There you have it, President Cyril Ramaphosa announcing um, that uh, cabinet has decided to lift the, to end the state of disaster. Well, let's get some reaction to some of uh, the key players. Uh, we'll start with uh, political parties before we get to business and other <coughs> organizations. And on the line, I do have Sevilla Guajube, who is the national spokesperson for the Democratic Alliance. Sevilla, your reaction? Uh, good evening, uh, uh, Vuyo, and uh, good evening to your viewers. Of course, we have been incredibly vocal about the need to lift the state of disaster. I think the president tonight went through a great deal to explain um, exactly the view that we've had, that you cannot uh, continue to instill the regulations of a state of disaster when, in fact, the disaster itself is, is seemingly not at play. And so we welcome the lifting of the, the state of disaster. Of course, we do so cautiously because we have seen uh, the uh, regulations that have been uh, uh, drafted and published, the health regulations, which some of them seem to emulate some uh, aspects of the state of disaster uh, and the public comments of which are are expected by the 16th of, of April. And so we are cautiously wel welcoming the, the lifting of the state of disaster because, of course, it's got other impacts. It's got other um, uh, ramifications in, in terms of tourism numbers, in terms of businesses, in terms of being able to retain jobs, and in, in terms of us being able to get back to some level of normality. But, of course, we've got to look at those health regulations very carefully our big worry there is the unvetted powers that the health minister seemingly would have, um, particularly where there's no requirement for him uh, to, to go to parliament or at least get expert advice on some of the regulations which could be clamped down on. And so we're looking at that quite closely. We've made our submissions uh, as per has been required. But uh, we, this is the correct move. We think that uh, it should have happened earlier, as the many calls have been happening around uh, the country. But uh, this is a step in the right direction. Uh, but, of course, we are deeply concerned about what is contained in the health regulations. And we are hoping that those not, do not become almost a substitute for what the state of disaster used to be. Well, hopefully you have or will be uh, making, I mean, your submissions in the time you have uh, up until the 16th. Very quickly, anything you think he could have said or said more of up outside of the health Look, regulations? I mean yeah. Yeah, look, I mean, Vuyo, uh, the, the reality is that, I mean, we have long been making the argument that the reality that we have is that the state of disaster has done more harm than COVID-19 itself in the, come in the last past couple of months. And so while the president went through great lengths of explaining what the, you know, what the country has been saying, um, we really would have hoped that 
uh, this would have happened earlier. And now we, we're in a situation, look, that now 30 days has to pass while there's transitional regulations, as, as, as was explained, and, and that's in accordance to the law. And so, in effect, really, while the state of disaster is lifted tonight, um, some of these regulations will, also, will only cease to exist in about 30 days' time. And in that time, we've got to make sure that, they, that government does not slip in problematic aspects of the state of disaster in the new health regulation because then that will really would not assist in any way because what we are wanting to do more than anything is to make sure that the country goes back to normal so we can start economic recovery as soon as possible the job stats that we saw last week are only going to continue to be worse if the economy is not allowed to run and run fully and we are concerned that the 30 million South Africans who are living in poverty, the 12 million South Africans who don't have jobs will continue to be victims of some of these government regulations if we do not uh, make enough noise and uh, interventions about what is to be contained in the health regulations. Well, oh, let's leave it there. Thank you very much uh, for your time this evening. Sevira Sevira Kwahube was the national spokesperson of uh, the official opposition, the Democratic Alliance. Cautiously welcoming uh, the pronouncements by uh, the president this evening, but of course um, having some reservations about the health regulations that she says could have uh, uh, could give you know the government unfettered powers, and that would be dangerous. But of course, people have uh, up until the 16th to influence those as well. Let's move on to the ANC now. The national spokesperson of the ANC, Bulamabe, is on the line. Mr. Mabe, uh, your party's reaction, please. Uh, evening, Buyo, and uh, evening to your viewers. Of course, we uh, welcome the lifting of the state of uh, disaster and agree uh, with uh, President Ramaphosa that we can only hope for better days ahead. We need to, put, it must be all hands on deck. We need to do everything else uh, in our power to make sure that we could uh, drive. Uh, economic recovery, support efforts by government to uh, massify vaccination so that we could uh, ultimately return to normalcy. Over the past two years, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has uh, ravaged the economy, displaced many others. But the relief measures that our government has introduced within that uh, intervening period, uh, including the 350 social relief grant, all of those were measures aimed at ensuring that uh, our people are not uh, completely and entirely displaced. They could still be able to find themselves, uh, be able to provide for uh, their necessities and all of that. And it's only a caring government that can actually uh, implement all of those things. What is now left is for communities out there, businesses out there, the ones that have been saying that they want the complete lifting of the state of disaster, to do everything else in their power, to feed into government efforts to help uh, reconstruct and recover our economy. Because the new economy will only emerge out of us working together. Now, um, the, 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 the DA, from what um, um, their spokesperson just said, are cautiously welcoming uh, what uh, President Ramaphosa had to say this evening. Uh, they have uh, some doubts, or reservations rather, about the health regulations, which they say may just uh, be the new state of disaster regulations, so to speak, uh, in the sense that it may give, um, you know, the government and unfettered powers um, via the back door. Do you share that concern? Well, uh, we, we do not share that uh, concern. It's quite unfortunate. Uh, last week, we were to all make, uh, you know, to start making the uh, input towards uh, the transitional uh, regulations. Uh, we did actually ourselves, as the ANC, uh, call on South Africans to participate in that uh, process because how government ultimately moves out of the state of disaster and how they transition, you've got to make sure that you do it in a manner and way that does not really disrupt some of the measures that you've put in place. And we have called on our structure to participate in that process. Because when they participate in the process, they will be able to then change uh, what exists and works in their own conditions. At the very same time, we've called on our people, even during this transitional period, that they must still make sure that uh, your, your, 
non-surgical surgical stuff like the wearing of masks where they put the exercising of uh, social distancing the especially wearing masks when they are indoors this could also be some of the measures that could still assist make sure that we could keep any possible spike of the COVID-19 pandemic so we do not share their view there is no way i mean uh, this attitude of always trying to project their government even when better things are being introduced to work for citizens to always uh, treat them with suspicion doesn't work we know the da is a, is a is an opposition party but we don't have to oppose for the sake of just opposing where there are measures that have been put in the best interest of the country as political parties from different divides let us join hands constructively put forward views that we think can help enhance or improve interventions that government is putting forward because dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic, it, 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 it goes beyond the, the political spectrum. You know, people who lost their lives uh, cannot just be defined uh, alongside the political affiliation. These are people, these are citizens. Lives were lost. And when you lose a life, boy, it doesn't matter which political party these people belong to. We as a country join hands and send condolences to those many families that lost their loved ones. Okay. By doing what we ought to be doing now, supporting this transitional effort that government is putting in place, is also to make sure that when the country ultimately returns to normality, it could normalcy, it could be under conditions that all of us as responsible political parties will work and act to safeguard. Because government alone will not be able to succeed. It requires all stakeholders to work and participate okay. in this constructive effort. Okay, and that's why we're going to leave it uh, with the ANC ANC national spokesperson, Bule Mabe. Let's take the last of the political players for now, and that is Sinao Tambo, who is the EFF's national spokesperson. Sinao, good evening. Thanks very much uh, for your time. Your reaction? The announcement of the effective termination of the national state of disaster, which has been in place for over the past two years, as an eventuality, because this uh, pandemic has come with a series of unscientific and irrational and inconsistent applications of lockdown regulations. And uh, we think that the President Ramaphosa has finally come to the realization that he cannot continue to keep ad hoc power, which comes as a result of a pandemic, forever to be able to micromanage South Africa. So what we want our government to reflect on as we come to the end of this dark chapter as our country is that this government failed to build a single new hospital, they failed to motivate our people to vaccinate, and they failed to implement diversity of vaccines as well. And, de and we're dependent on Western vaccine vaccines, which are provisioned uh, by the funders of civil process, such as ESPEN. So we must reflect on this pandemic in terms of understanding that this government is completely incompetent they were able to, in the face of the death of many of our people, conduct massive personal <coughs> and corruption, which rose to the highest ranks of Ramaphosa's office himself, from his spokesperson to his minister of health to his MECs in Houghton. They couldn't resist being corrupt even in the face of death. And that is a reflection that South Africans must be able to have. They had no pharmaceutical state capacity to contribute scientifically to vaccine uh, production across the world. We were spectators when the world was in one of the darkest moments in modern times. So we, we must note that and we must reflect on that as a country. But it's going further, the EFF will also carefully scrutinize these uh, regulations which are said to be integrated into the National Health Act so that we're able to make sure that we don't smuggle any policies that are going to give them any ad hoc power to micromanage us going forward in the future. And one special mention I'd like to make before uh, you cut me off is that you must thank the public representatives of the EFF, the collective leadership and the ground forces of the EFF for being at the forefront of defending our people during this pandemic. We were at the forefront of fighting for economic concessions. We were at the forefront of calling for the cutting of the repo rate for holidays and loan repayments and for the provision of financial relief to our people. In particular, the EFF was the highest donor to the COVID-19 relief fund, which our public representatives sacrificed 30% of their incomes for, for over three months. So, we want to salute our dedicated ground forces for dedicating themselves to our people during this period. And we want to say, let's move forward as a country and rescue ourselves from a government that has no capacity to defend us during a time of crisis.
Okay, and that's why we're going to leave it. Thanks very much uh, for your time. It's now Tambo, who is the EFF's national uh, spokesperson. Let's move on to uh, business organizations now and hear what uh, their responses are, starting with Chifiwa Chivengwa, who is the CEO of the South African Tourism Business Council. Mr. Chivengwa, good evening. Thanks very much uh, for your time. Your thoughts, uh, having listened to uh, the president then this evening? Well, I think that today is a significant day uh, in terms of what we've gone through for the past 750 days. Uh, you know, when we reflect back, uh, you know, the beginning of the pandemic, uh, us who are in the travel and tourism industry, uh, we were the first one to be closed. And indeed, uh, we became the last ones to be opened. And uh, we've gone through, you know, many difficult meetings uh, that were held with, uh, you know, government and other, you know, various uh, institutions uh, to really deal with, uh, you know, this pandemic because it was something that, uh, you know, majority of us didn't know what uh, we were in for. And therefore, you know, we learned along the way. Uh, there were lots of inconsistencies, uh, lots of things that were done uh, that we, you know, sat down, discuss, fight, make sure that we're correct. But I think that, uh, you know, that's in the past now. Uh, you know, we have seen the devastation that this pandemic has brought to us, the jobs that have been lost from the sector, uh, how the economy is impacted and how many young people are sitting at home uh, who could have joined, you know, this uh, industry should uh, there not be, uh, you know, this pandemic. Uh, but it's a health emergency. Uh, I think one of the things that we should be proud of is that as a country, I do believe that, uh, you know, we dealt with this uh, health emergency quite well compared to other countries. Uh, there were other areas of, of, of what we did uh, that we could have improved and that we could have led the world uh, in terms of how we respond to it. And there are many things that I've spoken about, including the issues of PCR tests, the issues of, um, you know, the, the vehicle's capacity, and many others, uh, you know, that we'll still have to deal with, including the issues that the president spoke about, uh, of events, you know, uh, the 50% uh, capacity, if those that are going there are fully vaccinated, or they've got a PCR test, we still need to address that, that issue, and many others. But I think today marks a day where we can say that now we can do a case study uh, of how we, we handle the situation, and we can learn from this, so that the future generations, when they face the pandemic, they can do things you know, slightly different uh, with more information at hand. But for us in the tourism industry, it's a good day. There are a lot of things that are going to go a long way in terms of... Um, how we manage within the hospitality sector. We have been taking temperatures uh, on a daily basis, fit people filling forms. That's a cost to business and that falls away and it's a good thing. Uh, and I do hope that we've learned our lessons uh, and we can continue to rebuild the sector and support the sector and deal with other issues uh, that we call the legacy issues that we had before the pandemic to make sure that you know, the, the tourism sector thrive and we're able to get those people that have lost their jobs to come back to work and many young people to join the industry. So it's a better day. Uh, we still are going to be looking at the health regulations to make sure that uh, they are indeed progressive. They will support the industry and also they are flexible uh, so that when the situation changes, we're able to change it because we cannot afford to have a regulation that's going to be uh, sort of stagnant, whereby when we need to change things, it's going to take longer to change things. We, we, we have to look and those unintended consequences that usually arises when we do this, reg this type of regulation. But it's a good day. It might, it's a significant day from the state of disaster, a significant day for COVID-19 management, and of course a significant day for us in the tourism industry as we you know, try to rebuild our sector and try to go back to normal. And we do hope we get support from South Africans to travel their own country. And again, we get the international market revived and we ensure that uh, you know, we move along swiftly in ensuring that, uh, you know, we rebound and we reclaim our position in the world market. Okay. So just to make sure I understood you I mean, correctly, you're saying that uh, what the president said uh, tonight adequately addresses the concerns you had um, with regard to how um, tourists incoming 
I mean, coming to the country would be treated. So you're happy with, uh, you know, uh, negative PCR test that's no, 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 no longer than 72 hours, uh, proof of vaccination, antigen test on arrival if, you know, um, uh, people are unable to, 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 produce, to produce those. So you're saying that addresses the concerns you've had and which you were like, really, you know, uh, engaging on and, and, and campaigning for? Well, it definitely does address the issues that we've raised uh, in terms of what we wanted and how we should be moving along. Uh, and also, you know, learning from others who have already implemented. So that addresses the concern for international inbound travelers as well as South Africans traveling back at home. It's quite simple. You're, if you're vaccinated, you produce the uh, proof of vaccination. If you are not, 72-hour uh, PCR test. And if you don't have uh, those two things, you get an antigen test. And if you're positive, uh, therefore you go and isolate. I think that's clear and that's progressive. That addresses the issues that we've been talking about for quite a number of months. Again, we still need to look at those things as we go to make sure that uh, we are not left behind as a country mm. because there will be progress in the management of COVID. Uh, you know, there will be things, you know, that scientists will discover that may require us not to ask for those things that we're asking now. So all I'm saying is that as we continue, we need to be progressive in the management. We need to listen to scientists to make sure that, you know, when we don't need to be requiring these things, we're not the last ones to remove them. There are other aspects that we, that we still need to work on. The aspects of gatherings are quite important because we do large events. It could be sporting events. It could be music festival. It could be a conference for businesses or associations meeting. We need to address that situation to make sure that, you know, the events industry you know, progresses and it recovers. And again, those are the things that are still on the regulations that are also contemplated on the regulations that are been published by the Department of Health. We need to deal with those things to make sure that they are progressive. And we, we, we cannot stifle a certain segment, uh, you know, of the industry mm. uh, without any scientific evidence that we should be doing so. So okay. all I'm saying is that we need to look at all those things that are there. What the president announced tonight, progressive, the end of the state of the of, of disaster we now need to move to the health regulation to make sure that they are progressive because we may find ourselves in a situation where we've got unintended consequences because of the regulations that we that are contemplated so we will be participating in that we will make our voice heard we will put our case forward but we hope that we move swiftly forward and we open up the events industry to make sure that those you know, that are, are operating in that industry who have been devastated. And majority of them are small businesses. Okay. They can be able to go back to build stands and so forth and so on and participate in exhibitions. Sifua, thank you very much uh, for your time um, this evening. He is the CEO of the South African Tourism uh, Business Council. Let's move on now to the Black Business uh, Council. And uh, we have um, the uh, CEO, Khangi Matabane. So, Matabane, good evening. Thanks very much for your time. Your reaction as the Black Business Council? Good evening, Vuyo, and the listeners, uh, and the viewers. Uh, thank you very much for, for having us. We, we welcome the, the lifting of the state of disaster. Uh, this is actually a relief to, 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 to a lot of businesses and a lot of our members. And we, we are positive that now, within 30 days, we'll basically go back to, to, to near normal. Uh, we are very much cognizant of the fact that uh, this has been a very, very difficult uh, time. Uh, it has been a very, very difficult balance for the, for the, for the president, uh, you can imagine. Uh, you remember the, 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 the intention was to minimize the loss of jobs, but also minimize the, 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 the loss of lives. And, and I think uh, we, we relatively achieved that if you compare us with the other countries. But uh, we've also learned a lot uh, of uh, how to collaborate uh, between all the social partners, uh, government, uh, communities, labor, and, and, and business. And we're hopeful that... Uh, the very same vigor that we, we have displayed uh, in dealing with the pandemic, we will use it to to then deal with the scale of unemployment. And we, we've got uh, around 11 million, uh, sorry, 13 million people unemployed, uh, as, as released by the state of last week. So we need to then divert all our energies uh, and refocus uh, and focus on growing the economy. 
Any areas uh, of, uh, of, of concern still? I, I think the, the, the areas of concern, I think it's the, 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 the issue of the, uh, that, that was touched by, by the previous colleague, uh, the issues of, of, of gatherings. And so we were encouraging all our members, uh, all business people, all citizens of the country to, to, to go and vaccinate. Because once a uh, majority of us have vaccinated, we will be able then to, to reopen uh, almost the entire economy. Uh, because remember, when you look at the value chain of, of tourism, a lot of small businesses depend on uh, this type of events. Uh, yeah, you, you, you just go to the stadium, for example, a lot of people will be sailing around. So the, the numbers are, are important. So we, we need to find a way of getting to 100% uh, by in making sure that everyone is, is almost everyone who, uh, who wishes to, vac to be vaccinated has vaccinated. So once that is done, I think it will be able to reopen the economy. And that's where we're going to leave it. Thank you very much uh, for your time, Kangi Mataban from the Black uh, Business uh, Council. And uh, that's how we come to the end. Thanks for watching. We also thank the viewers of SABC2 who are also part um, of this special broadcast. Till we meet again.